Welcome to Whole Team Eats Podcast, a 24-8 media production. Ever wonder who trains your favorite athlete? Join Tim Miller as he takes a look at the behind the scenes training of professional and collegiate athletes. Tim connects with trainers, athletes, and others in the sports community to share their stories. This podcast is dedicated to highlighting the work of athletes and trainers to inspire action and build community. What's up, everyone? Welcome to an all new episode of Whole Team Meets Podcast. This is season three, episode eight. I'm your host, Tim Miller, and on this show, I sit down with strength and performance coach Josh Cuthbert. Growing up in South Florida, Josh was always playing sports and was passionate from a young age. Josh would go on to receive a scholarship from Louisiana Tech, where he played football. After enduring several injuries during his playing days and going through multiple surgeries, it eventually led Josh into training. Trainings had had always been something that Josh had truly loved doing. On the show, we discussed the impact that his dad had on his work ethic by instilling a first one in, last one out mentality. This mentality played a pivotal role in starting and growing his training business into what it is today. Josh talks about the process to keep his athletes at the top of their game year round. Josh works with professional athletes such as George Kittle, TJ Hawkinson, and Oren Burks. It is my pleasure to introduce strength coach Josh Cuthbert to the show. Josh, welcome. Thanks, Tim. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, we've uh, connected a while back and then finally happy to have you on the show. Uh, you have a uh, you know, great story from uh, you know how you broke into the training industry and you name uh coach a lot of notable athletes here. So uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to ask how training has been to start 2024. We're about a month and a half, or I guess two months in now. Uh, how's it been so far in 2024? So I, I get this question a lot. And every year, it seems like it starts a little bit later, whether it's a year later, um, or a year later, a month later, because players are going deeper into the playoffs. We obviously have that 17th game now. A lot of my guys are what I would consider seasoned veterans now. So they're, they're taking an extra week or two off in the off season, um, enjoying their time off. And then we're really just now getting back and going. I know when we first connected first week of February was kind of, kind of go time. Now, third week of February, I had eight guys come in next week. I have another two guys that'll come in. And then by mid March, I'll probably have 13 or 14, but as we as they get older they're really enjoying that that month that turns into six weeks or whatever it is or you know to their defense a lot of them were in the super bowl had three guys in the super bowl so they played you know through valentine's day i mean they're only two weeks out um and you know i've always been a proponent of, of taking that time off allowing your body to recover allowing your body to reset you don't need to reset too hard you need to reset too much um, because, you know, bless their heart. It's to my knowledge, it's the only sport where, you know, the 49ers played in the Super Bowl against the Chiefs and they finished second week of February. Well, they technically report back to OTAs April 15th. That's eight weeks later, two months later. Yeah. Um, and that's technically it's voluntary organized team activities, but none of my guys miss OTAs. So it's not very voluntary. They get two months. And then they're there from April 15th till about the 15th of June. Then they have six more weeks with me and then they're back the last week of July. So their, their total off season has, has really just done this as far as time completely off. Um, but so far so good, you know, I'm easing guys back into the process. I take them through a couple of different phases. We're very lightly into phase one right now, and I'm trying not to crush them so that they, uh, they feel good at this time of year, which, which I want, I want strength, but I want them to feel like they're still recovering. Yeah. So you talk about allowing their bodies to reset, giving them time to kind of uh, take a step back from training and the season, because it's a, uh, it's a long season, 17 weeks now in playoffs, especially for the 49ers guys going to the Super Bowl this year. Uh, you know, it's a lot on their bodies. Um, but, but you talked about phase one. So what is your progress when you get those athletes back in the gym? So you start with uh, easing them into their program for the off season, then you kind of ramp it up as it goes. Yeah, it's a, it's a linear progression. Everybody will come in um, and I'll meet with them. We'll, we'll talk over coffee 
uh, talk about goals, see how they felt last year, they, what they felt like they lacked, if anything, what they would like to improve upon. And that gives me a good idea of what we need to implement for them this upcoming season. But then we'll, we'll start, for a better term, we'll start light. We're, we're working our body. We're moving our body through what, what I would call general physical preparation. So just like a GPP phase. Um, no back squats, no front squats, no deadlifts, none of that stuff for the first couple of weeks. I'm just looking for range of motion. I'm looking for uh, muscle activation techniques. So I'm, I'm taking them through some various ranges of motion that they probably haven't been in in a while and just really getting the body, we'll call it, um, I'm lotioning the joints at that point. Like I'm lubricating the joints so that they're, they're more prepared to accept the load, accept the, the weights that I'm going to give them in the coming weeks, months throughout the off season. Um, it's a good way for me to get them moving, but not break them down. But there's a, there's a fine line because they, they might leave me, um, squatting, you know, four or 500 pounds, um, deadlifting four or five, 600 pounds in July. And then I get them back and they might only be squatting, you know, two or 300 pounds or deadlifting three or 400 pounds. Like their strength does this throughout the season because it's not the priority. They strength train very little. And I, I want to try to maximize how strong I can get them when they leave because I know it's going down. But in a perfect world, they wouldn't come to me 150 pounds weaker than they were when I left them. Um, so I gotta talk, I'm got i trying to find a way with these guys to emphasize while we're trying to recover. We do We have such a limited time to try to build back that strength. And that strength is so important 19, 20 weeks into the season when you're still trying to produce force down after down game after game week after week if you don't have that strength that's where your body really just it really breaks down and your resiliency goes through the floor yeah and when you're talking about uh their bodies being uh, going through a taxing nfl season yet you train some of the guys who are in the more physical positions right Mm -hmm. you name uh, one one athlete we're talking about before in the 49ers george kittle he plays Mm -hmm. tight end and he's known to play a physical style of a game so how do you take somebody like george and kind of uh you know, help him take the load off in the first couple of weeks and then kind of ramp up that strength training. So George, George is unique. Um, you said it the way, the way he plays the game. Um, he's also unique in how he approaches his training. Um, he understands the importance of, and this is what I'm trying to get a lot of my guys to do of not peaking in July. Like so many people, they're trying to peak as they go into training camp. And I don't know if I can cuss on this show, but I, I'm going to. So, um, Nobody gives a fuck how strong or how fast or whatever that is in training camp. Your first game is not for six more weeks. So I'll, I'll start him early, but he's, he's fortunate enough to where he can continue doing what we've been doing through training camp. So that helps, helps our progression. And we're looking for, we're looking for many peaks throughout the season. And we talked about mentors. He's not a mentor of mine. He's just a guy that I really respect. His name's Bob Stroop. He's Pat Mahomes, a strength coach. Um, he talks about it. Why, why are we peaking week one? Why are we peaking? We're not Olympic athletes where we have to peak for one event every four years. Like we have to maintain a high level of training, a high level of performance for 16, 17, 18, 19 weeks. So somebody like George, we're looking to hit decent numbers for 16 weeks. We're, we're front squatting 400 pounds, at least a couple reps in week two. I'm having him do it again in week six. He's, he's texting me in December. He's still front squatting heavy weight for sets of three to five because we're, we're still, we're, we're getting to here, but we want to stay here, right? We don't want this bam, but you can only peak, you can only truly peak once. And then this starts to occur. So we, we try to keep these guys at 95%. So right now I'm building the base, right? I'm building the engine. I'm allowing them to have enough aerobic threshold to accept all the load that I'm giving And then by the last week of March, we're going to be lifting pretty heavy. Um, Not a ton of volume. Uh, You know, they're, they're Ferraris, right? All these guys are Ferraris. They're, if you put them on the street, they're the best athlete you've ever seen to somebody like you or I. Um, And I don't want to break the Ferrari down, right? George is going into week or or year eight, eight, eight or nine. Um, And I don't want to break that Ferrari down, but I do want him to remain a Ferrari for as long as I can. Right. So it's always a struggle for me and for my guys trying to figure out what that maximum, what I would call maximum recoverable volume is. Like how much can I do in which he can still recover appropriately 
is so progressing. Because if I go over that threshold, then it's hard for him to give me good performance, good intensity day after day, week after week, right? Because he's broken down. He feels overtrained, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's something that takes a lot of fine tuning. And you really have to know your athletes. You have to know what they're giving you. You have to know their stressors. You have to know their effort level. And that doesn't come from the first season with me. I really don't begin to learn that until I've worked with somebody for 12 weeks or so. And that's assuming they give me good effort and they give me everything that I'm asking for each time we train. Yeah. And knowing every athlete on an individual level is extremely important when, you know, you know better than anybody. It's not only just knowing their trainer or, or sorry, knowing them on an individual uh, athlete level, knowing how they are on that day, mentally, physically, you need to understand and connect with those athletes because like you said, they're trusting you uh, with the most important investment, which is their bodies, right? And their bodies is what allows them to uh, remain healthy and, and get that next contract and, and keep playing. And uh, when you're talking about somebody like George Kittle, he's at the top of his game, still in eight year, uh, year eight, year nine, just playing the Super Bowl. And, uh, you know, you want to make sure that he's able to play as long as, as he wants to and as long as he's capable of playing at, at a top level. Um, I want to take a step back here for a second. And uh, where a lot of my episodes usually kick off is talking about uh, you, Josh Cuthbert, as uh, a trainer, but really kind of your background and, and letting our audience learn about, you know, where did you grow up? Did you play sports? And then ultimately, how did you come into training and how did you know it was the right career for you? Um, I grew up in South Florida. It's just me and dad. I played multiple sports in high school, football, baseball, um, stopped playing basketball by maybe 11th grade. I'm only 5'11", I can only do so much. Um, football, baseball, track, uh, got a scholarship to Louisiana Tech uh, to play football, um, was there from 2008 to 2012, um, played, played a lot of ball there. Uh, that's where my, my love probably for the weight room came in. Um, I love the grind. I was, uh, it was instilled in me early to be the first one in the last one out type mentality. Um, my dad did a really good job of instilling that in me and it stuck with me. And that's probably why I'm, I'm here today. I, I did unfortunately have some surgeries some injuries throughout college, which led me to a path of what I, what I actually truly love. And I think that's why I've continued to grow is like the return to sport, like kind of that in between that middleman because I had my knee surgeries and then I tore my ACL again for the third time, my senior year of pro day. I just wasn't, I wasn't there. There was, there was a huge gap between it's six months. Society says you're good to go. And I could run, I could sprint, I could cut. And what truly was considered good to go for a sport or something where I'm putting forth maximum effort, like I was at a pro day, and it wasn't anybody's fault. I mean, I went to lose in a tech. We had one athletic trainer and one, and they, I think he had one assistant. There's only so much. You go through six months and then they're like, hey, you're back with the guys. And then our strength coach, we had one strength coach and two unpaid interns. He couldn't give me the effort or the attention that he needed because he's got 120 guys and there's three people on the staff. So he's, you know, they, they said, you're in, you're in. So bad habits, um, biomechanics were terrible at that time, but nobody was there to watch it, right? Yeah. So I, I did fall in love briefly with uh, just the, the in-between. Um, I spoke at NSCA conference a couple of years ago on bridging the gap between rehab and truly um, peak performance returning to sport. And when I went to Cal Berkeley, I was, I was fortunate that when I got there as an intern, they, uh, they fired two of their strength coaches on staff. So I got kind of thrown into the mix which was one of the best experiences I've ever had because I, it was, you know, either sink or swim at that point. Um, and I, I got to work with a lot of the injured guys, got to work with the quarterbacks and I got to use my mind and my brain a lot more than I would have because I, I thought about when I was at tech, you know, if you were in the injured group, you would do pushups and sit-ups on the side, right. Or you do, you know, if, if it was your arm, you'd do some curls on the other arm. But that was, I mean, that's the shit that they had you do because there, there just wasn't enough manpower but I got to use my brain a lot more and I tried to really improve these guys' performance while they were injured and actually take them through something that was meaningful versus just checking the boxes. Um, working with the quarterbacks was fun too. I, golf was there at that time. So I, I got to work with Jared um, Golf and uh, Webb, the hell's Webb's first name. Um, 
he was in the NFL for a few years too, but yeah, like two NFL played, quarterbacks. Played for the Giants, right? Giants, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, yeah. Like I was saying, it'll come to us. Yeah. Anyway, um, so the, I mean, that was that was a great opportunity for me. I, I missed out on a full time position there because I didn't have my master's yet. So my my mentor, two two of my mentors, uh, Damon Harrington and Scott Saltwasser, both encouraged me to go get my master's, which is how I ended up at Ole Miss. Um, got my master's, worked with Paul Jackson, who, in my opinion, is one of the best strength coaches in football. Um, there's so much turnover at the college level, though. When he left, he got fired at Ole Miss, not fired because he was underperforming, fired because they got a new head coach, yep. and a head coach is going to bring in their guy. So he's at Utah State, and you know he gets to Utah State, and they go 11-1 and the first year. So I've had some really good exposure to some of the what I would consider the top-end college strength coaches in the industry. Um, different philosophies. So when you, when you're somebody like me, you take bits and pieces of everything that you've been exposed to. And I'm not talking bits and pieces of the shit that I post on Instagram, because if you're listening to this, don't just take something that I post on Instagram or John Russin post on Instagram or, or Saul Wasser post and just throw it into your program and think that it fits. Like there's gotta be, there's gotta be more rhyme to the reason. There's, there's a reason why I'm programming it when I program it. There's a reason why they're programming it. You may like the exercise. You may like the movement, but there's got to be a reason why you want to use it, right? Mm-hmm. And it's hard to see that in a one-minute reel. Um, it takes the real-life exposure, the, the weeks, the months with somebody to really, truly understand why they're doing what they're doing because I got so much exposure from these three guys that it was able to help blend my my performance body method that I, I implement now, you know, with with my people. Like that is that is my method, that is my principles. I know when they leave in July, I'm already thinking in August what I'm gonna do next January, February. It just it starts then. Um, I can I kind of go back and I reassess everything that we've done throughout the offseason. I'll take all my my maxes, which is a three rep max. I take my loads from my guys. I assess their performance. I look at all the metrics. I see where we were. And then I'll audit myself to see what I think could have been better based on the performance that I received when everybody was leaving. And if there's areas that I see holes, then when I'm looking at my programming for next year, I'm going to start filling those gaps then. For instance, one thing that I wanted to see a little bit more of was frontal plane as in lateral movements. I wanted to see more range of motion through my guys. I wanted to see less less adductor strains. George has had this damn adductor thing for like four years. It's fucking driving me crazy because I'm implementing all kinds of shit with him. And luckily he was the only one. I, I touched base with 18 guys this off season. He was the only true adductor injury. And it was the last day of camp in team period, you know, four weeks in and he's running 70 plays a day. It, it just happens. Like he was, he was a little bit run down in my opinion. But with that being said, I don't want an adductor strain. I want to make sure we stay healthy there. So I'm finding ways early that we're working in adductor work twice a week. now. We weren't doing that twice a week last February, but we are now. And hopefully come next August, as people are leaving camp, I'll see a positive correlation to what I did. But it's not because I saw it on Instagram and it, it, it looked pretty and I think it makes sense. It has to fit into what I'm doing in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, it has to fit for your athlete at that point in time. Hundred percent, depending on what they're doing and, and their, uh, you know, injury history, career progression. There's just so many different factors. So when you're putting a program together, it's really not one size fits all, but it's tailored to the individual athlete's performance. Um, so uh, you you've talked about how you're implementing different things, and you look in August, and you're already thinking all as far out as uh, the new year for how you're going to start implementing. What's the next progression for this individual athlete? And all you do that for all your guys. Um, But how would you say it's been different for somebody who may be a rookie or a year or two into their career versus somebody who's uh, on the later side of their career or, you know, eight to 10 years in? We we ramp up quicker uh, with the younger guys. Um, Our movement patterns might be a little bit more aggressive. I I look at somebody like, uh, we'll say TJ Hawkinson, right? He's, he's a stud. He's strong. He's fast. He's big, but he comes from Iowa as to George and they train really fucking hard at Iowa. They had a lot of mileage on them. So for the most part, I'm not looking to truly increase TJ's performance. I don't think he's pretty close to his genetic threshold, but then I'll take a guy like uh, Justin school 
who came from Vanderbilt and he was drastically under, under trained, right? He had so much left in the tank. We've put on 200 pounds on his squat and 250 pounds on his deadlift, almost a hundred pounds on his bench in the past three or four years. But he had so much more in him based on his exposure at the college level. So that, that to me serves more um, of importance as opposed to their age. I need to know what they've done in the past. Like TJ and George, they came out and they were already strong. They were already fast. They were, they were freaks, but they trained a ton, right? So I wasn't going to hit them as heavy as somebody that still had so much left in the tank. Not everybody has more room to bump, right? So with that being said, my older guys, I know no matter what their threshold is, Justin's one of those guys, school is one of those guys now. He's in the same tier as George, TJ, Rob. He's extremely trained. So he's kind of in this, um, we're at a modified maintenance looking to improve on slight aspects of performance, but I'm not trying to improve all the way across the board. Can't happen yeah. anymore. Yeah. Where you give me a guy that doesn't have a ton of training exposure, I can get him stronger in various different things. And he can be going into year seven. It can still be very untrained. I took a guy last year, he's with the Texans, um, and his unilateral strength was atrocious. I had women that were strong. He's 320 pounds. So we started working on that. And he told me a couple of weeks ago, he said, man, I'm just going to be honest with you. I wasn't into that shit before, but week three, and I'm like stepping back with one foot and I'm just like stalemating people. Now I understand I was stronger than I've ever been without really doing a ton of back squats, but he needed to develop that strength because he hadn't done it before. Yeah. And just finding these little areas, like it might be back squats for somebody. Somebody might be a strong lunger, but they haven't back squatted a ton in their life. So I can implement more back squats with them. It just depends on the person, really. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that's you just reassessing every every player and looking at their strengths and weaknesses. And you need to, uh, you know, as, as a trainer, you've grown throughout your career to be able to identify those things very quickly. And yep. uh, that's why these, these athletes trust you with their bodies and then trust you with their training. So we've talked a lot about the physical side of training, but from what we know and what we hear uh, from a lot of our trainers is the mental side is equally, if not more important. How do you handle the mental side of, of uh, you know, training these athletes both in the off season and then when they're with their respective teams in season? I'm sure you have a lot of communication with them year round. Um, you know, pe players are getting traded. Players are going through different uh, family situations. They come from different areas. Like, what is it like as a trainer? Because you, you're so connected to these players. What is it like on the mental side of things, trying to help them through hurdles that they're dealing with? But you, you touched on that in a different way than most people touch on that. Most people, they talk about the mental side of things and they're always thinking mental toughness, the grind, all that stuff. That's, that's not it. We're not, we're not Navy SEALs training. We're not freshmen in college where we're trying to make or break you anymore. The mental side of things now is, is showing up at 9 a.m. in February when it's 21 degrees outside. And you, you, you don't really want to do it yet, right? You just don't. It sucks. But you know that you've got to report in eight weeks, right? So overcoming those mental hurdles, your wife had a baby, you know, you have all these things, the trades, all that stuff. And for me, the mental side of things comes from the buy-in. I get these guys, if you're bought in to what I have going on, that, that negative thought process becomes much less, right? It's something that they enjoy, something they look forward to ish. It's still training, but the fact that they know, they know what they're getting when they step into the weight room, we've, we've developed a brand amongst our guys. They know the energy, they know the environment, and it's something that they can look forward to. If they didn't love it, they wouldn't come back every year. Yeah. If they didn't come back every year, I wouldn't be on this podcast right now. So for me, at least in the off season, that's the thing that I, I really try to emphasize most is I control my energy. And I'm not in here like hoo-ha on these guys, right? But I know that when they come into the weight room with me, I can't be negative energy. Mm -hmm. They got their own shit going on. I got to be a positive influence on their day. At least bring them up to neutral, right? Even if they are in a, a tougher than normal position. Um, and then the in-season, it's just touch and base with these guys. You know, they, they get seen on TV. There's Twitter. They have all these different things that are coming at them from different areas. They're getting just drunk through the mud, especially the big guys. Um, 
so just a simple Instagram message or a text with a meme or a joke to get their mind off of what they're trying not to read, bring them back into, they're still humans, right? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm texting with, with George and Oren during the Super Bowl, Super Bowl week, just, just talking shit. Like we're just, we're just, we're just having fun. Um, and I think that's, that's so key and it's key for people to hear, for people to know that th these guys are just as human as you and I, or the people that are listening to this podcast, they're just doing their job. And then yes, they get paid a lot of money and there's a lot of stakes that are on it, but they are human at the end of the day. Like if you look, if you look at George's eyes at the end of the Super Bowl, even if you don't know him, like I do, you could feel, you could feel, you could feel the pain like that. I've never played in the Super Bowl. I lost a conference championship game in college lost the state championship in high school and the state championship in high school at that point was probably the most hurt. I, I mean, I was just devastated. I didn't want to, you know, just sat on the field, I right? Just laid there. Same thing in college, just, you know, unbearable. Now you take that and you multiply it to, you're looking at somebody that's 0.1% and 0.001. And then if you put at, playing in the Super Bowl, it's like one in a, fucking hundred million. Like it's insane numbers. Yeah. And then you lose by three, like the, the pain and the pressure and all the stuff that you're feeling. It's, it's more than any of us can ever really relate to. So with all of that, just making these guys feel human all the time is as best I can do. And that's the, that's the connection. That's the networking. It's, it's what brings people back is because we are human. We are friends. We connect outside of just, barbells, dumbbells, and kettlebells. Yeah. And I think that's important for the athletes to see you as somebody more than a trainer, somebody they can connect with and rely on. And when you're a professional athlete, there's so many people coming at you for a variety of things, right? Endorsements mm -hmm. and uh, trying to uh, crack into your inner circle for a number of reasons. And somebody who like you, they can rely on to just take a step back and get it, send a meme to, or talk, talk shit to during Super Bowl week and kind of get their mind off of the pressure and everything else going on because these guys are extremely busy. Uh, we don't want to pretend like we know what goes on in their lives because we don't, right? We're not the top one zero one one or zero 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 one percent of athletes who are playing in Super Bowls. So you have a huge responsibility to them and, and, uh, I, I'm assuming they, they really appreciate your relationship. Um, I wanted to, uh, you know, talk about, you know, you've talked about a lot about uh, the, the athletes that you train, mostly NFL athletes. I guess a lot of your training is NFL athletes, but what other sports or, uh, you know, people do, do you train besides just NFL guys? Um, probably touch, um, at least five or six different professional sports. I worked with uh, Sean Johnson, who was a former Olympian um, gymnast. Um, I've worked with MMA fighters. Um, I've worked with Darius Garland, uh, who's in the NBA, plays for the Cavs. Um, Pedro Alvarez, Julio Burbos, who both were um, very dimensional baseball players. I have really niched down, though, over the years um, into mostly NFL uh, I do have some general population. Then I'll take a handful of college athletes in the off season. That's gotten a lot less over the years as their requirements are so much greater at their university. So it's hard for me to generate that relationship with them at the college level because they have to be back. They only get about two weeks off and then maybe I'll get a couple of weeks with some people, but it's not like truly at that point, they're not coming through my methods, my programming. We're just, we're working out for a couple of weeks and then I'm sending them back. Um, but when I get to a point where I got any from 10 to 20 NFL guys, I got tight end you in July, we're running two groups at George's 10 to 12 people at a time that takes a lot of my time, effort and energy for, for the season. And then I really transition into a lot of my online training that I do. Um, and then my in-person group, um, small group sessions, I run three or four of those a day. And then most of my effort goes into uh, the online and then some consulting roles that I have with some various companies. Yeah. And, and you've really built out this training platform that you have, whether it's in person or online. And, uh, you know, you're a, a, you know, a pretty big name in the industry within the training industry since you've, you've been in it. And, uh, you know, you've, you've trained a lot of notable athletes in your, in your time in the training world. Um, I wanted to ask you about 
hardships or hurdles that you faced? I know it, it seems like, oh yeah, you have all these great athletes and, and top of their game, but you've obviously done a lot to get to the point that you're at. So can you talk about some of the roadblocks or hardships or hurdles that you had to overcome cracking into this industry? Like how do you gain the trust of a George Kittle or any of these guys in, in the pro pro ranks? That's good. And I love this um, because most people don't know this. I'm not posting about it on my Instagram. It's been years ago, but uh, one of my first big breaks at my first facility here, I was working with uh, Eric Decker, Bernard Pollard, Michael Orr. Um, you know, I had some big name guys early in my career, and that was simply because I was able to communicate with them and I sold myself as something that they needed. Um, they were in my facility for PT. I sold them on training and then we got going. Um, I started working with, uh, Trent Taylor, who's with, uh, the Chicago bears. Now he used to be with the Niners with George, him and George are good friends. And George came in for a summer and I think we've been working together hmm, maybe four or five weeks. If that, um, word got out at my facility that I was leaving, considering leaving and I got shit canned. They walked my ass out the door and said, don't come back. Oh, wow. And all, like all communication at that time was through like a work phone all that stuff. So all my NFL athletes, they were showing up. I wasn't there. Um, bless them. Uh, I was training some dudes out of the Y. I was training George, Tanya, uh, Quentin Patton, Trent Taylor. I'm training them out of the YMCA. Got kicked out of there because you weren't allowed to just train people as a non-trainer there, right? Yeah. There was a point where we were training in George's, uh, not even garage, like driveway in July. Like Bulgarian split squats, jumps. Um, hurdle jumps like in this East Nashville Airbnb driveway. Uh, he breaks the record for yards the next year, calls me uh, that off season. like, Hey, I'm moving to Nashville, whatever, you know, I don't know what your situation is now. Um, hopefully it's better than it was uh, when I left. You know, I, I appreciated the grind. I appreciated the time that you put into making it work for me, but um, that was tough, man. I, uh, I fought off a, a non-compete for about a year. Um, yeah, they, you know, they were trying to sue me and, and all these different things. And I had cons considered giving up training wasn't ever really an option. I just had to find a way um, to make it through that year without really seeing any of my former clientele and kind of starting over. Um, yeah. And that was that was tough. Uh, but we're here now. Um, fuck those guys. Um, uh, and yeah. Um, you know, jokes on them because I'm still kicking ass and, and they ain't got shit. So yeah. here we are. And then that speaks to you as a trainer, right? That just because you were not part of that facility anymore doesn't mean that your guys weren't going to stop contacting you because yeah. clearly something 100%. that you were doing was yeah. keeping them at the top of their game. They liked your training. They bought mm -hmm. into your programs and they trusted you as not only a trainer, but as a person. So yeah. uh, that speaks to, you know, volumes to you as a, uh, on the training level, on the personal level, is that at that point when you leave that facility, George texts you, he breaks the record for yards next season. Is that when you moved yourself and your business to Nashville? Uh, no, I was in Nashville. Oh, you're so in Nashville. He, he was visiting Trent that off season. And that's when he first started training with us. Um, so gotcha. I was already here. Um, I uh, joined another facility at that time. So I was, I was boots on the ground. Like I was ready to go. Um, and then he moved back and he, he had bought a different house before he had the barn and then COVID hit. So we're, yep. we're in a garage, uh, two garages, Connor McDermott and George both had a garage. We outfitted both of them and I'd run six guys at one and then I'd run six guys at the other. And that was great too. Um, COVID was, was tough, right? I mean, we were training, we couldn't train at the gym. Gym was closed down. I was in there. Uh, health marshal comes in. Like you can't be doing this. And I had, I was trying to act like it was like a, a zoom or like I was recording. I had like six guys in there, but I had a camera. I'm like, no, 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 this, you know, we're just, we're just filming. He's like, yeah, yeah, you got, you got to get out. Like, no, this can't happen. So then we, we were in a garage running six guys, two different garages. And we had, we had a great off season because it was long and there was no OTAs. I was actually able to take them through what I would consider the appropriate amount of training for an off season. I could take, I took them through three, eight week blocks because they didn't have to be back and nobody got hurt. But off season, uh, skeletal muscle injuries were down drastically hamstrings, quads, all that stuff. 
but uh, you know they didn't really fight for it during the uh, NFLPA. The next year, they lobbied for an increase in in pay. So I guess I can't really fault them on that. League yeah. minimum went up a couple hundred thousand, and they still got to go to OTA. So here we are. Um, it is amazing what proper training can do for an athlete, uh, just in terms of staying healthy, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, having that. Uh, appropriate level or amount of time to make sure that you are able to implement the plans that you need to implement for each specific athlete. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot about your background and how you got to where you are today, who you train, where you've moved and kind of everything all encompassing and, and uh, you know, where you are currently, but what about the future? Like, what does the future look like in the next three to five years for your training? Um, talked about it a little bit earlier. I'm really niching down. Um, I'm eliminating uh, any client or clientele that doesn't like truly bring me joy. I I just, I can't anymore. Um, for years, I was in a position where I had to take some people that maybe weren't my favorite because I needed the money or whatever it is. But um, I got a consulting role with Techno Gym. I mean, we got some of the best equipment in the world. I mean, we're providing equipment for the Olympics, Summer Olympics this year. Um, George's whole facility is equipped with Techno Gym. I got five pieces at my gym that's Techno Gym. I mean, they're top of the line. So continuing to grow that brand, trying to get them into our, like my world, which is what I do is kind of bridging the gap between this high-end fitness equipment and performance training. So we now have some some pieces that are are, are really, really nice. Um, Alabama got 20 of our treadmills. I mean, we're, we're getting there. Um, so continue to grow that relationship with them. Um, and then I'll be at a point where it's just my NFL guys, honestly, like that's, that's where I've always wanted to be is just really pour into those guys. Because if I'm being honest and I, I say this every year and, uh, I hope people don't get offended, but that's who I, that's who I like training. Like that brings me joy. I put all my energy into it. My energy is higher than because I'm providing energy. Right. So it's, it's good for me from now to July is like my, my in season. Like I'm, I'm at it right now. I'm, I'm full steam ahead. Um, and then I can kind of downregulate myself after that, um, do some more speaking, something that I want to get more into, which I did a little bit last year, more speaking engagements, talk more about my brand, talk about my guys, continue to grow the techno gym performance side and, and really just see where that takes me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you've done a lot to put yourself in position to be able to just focus on your NFL guys as far as you know, Techno Gym and growing that brand. And, you know, we're, we are excited and the first ones to, to make sure we're tuned in when you have more speaking engagements and go on more podcasts and kind of grow your brand from that side as well. Um, one question I like to kind of end with uh, for a lot of my trainers is you've, you've gone through a lot in your training journey. You've met a lot of people, trained a lot of different people. You've kind of found what you liked personally and then you've talked about niching down for NFL guys and pouring everything in that you've learned from a programming standpoint into those guys. But what advice would you give to your younger self starting out? And would you change anything about your journey to this point? Um, yeah. And I, I, I tell people this all the time. I like everybody wanted to train athletes. I was an athlete. I wanted, I wanted to be in the position I'm in. I would say that most trainers don't, they just don't get here. Um, I got lucky from being honest, but you know, I, I do work hard. I worked hard. I, I did what I would consider, you know, the necessary steps to get to this point. But a lot of people do. So I'm not going to bullshit it and say, that, you know, other people didn't try. And, you know, my book was just different than theirs. But I also, I got really good at training people. I got really good relationships with people. Be better with people is the reason that I'm in this position. Not because my methods and my program is that much better or that much different. It's that my athletes buy into it. And if they're not buying into what you're doing, then they're not going to have the success that you need. Improv classes, comedy classes, like do the thing, make people laugh. I think is, is huge. Don't be a class clown, but be able to make people laugh, have that engagement and that enjoyment with people. And that will truly give you the opportunity that, that you're not getting now. If people don't want to be around you, they don't want to be around you. You got to be a positive light in their day. And then of course you got to deliver results, right? So I've, I've worked with 80 year olds and knee replacements. I've had seven year old group fitness classes, speed classes. I've, I've done this, like the whole spectrum. I've done it all. I've worked with military. I've worked with special forces. I've done, I've done it all, but I know what I like now, but I wouldn't have gotten really good at training people 
whether it's fat loss, muscle, performance, if I didn't have exposure to all those people, all of those little micro bits of exposure, the way my mind has to think with a lady who had a knee replacement, it's obviously way different than working with somebody like Trent Taylor who returns punts in the NFL. But I'm still, that actually is much more difficult for me because she wants to improve. She doesn't want to hurt. She wants to get stronger. Fuck, that's hard. She, her knee was just replaced, right? She's <laughs> not, she's not an NFL athlete. Those guys are easy. So being, being open to the idea of getting outside of what I would consider is your comfort zone, working with people that aren't necessarily your niche, but that can make you a stronger, better coach isn't a bad thing. Don't, don't just think that you're going to niche down because you work in D1 and athletes are going to just pour to you because that shit don't happen. I'm just going to be honest. Like you got to be really fucking good at delivering results. Be really, be even better with people. And when your big break comes, you have to capture it. Like that is your time. You might get one chance with one NFL athlete. Don't fuck it up because you might only get one. If that one goes well, that's where the growth comes. Yeah. I think that's an interesting perspective. We don't hear from a lot of folks is a lot of trainers like yourself, they want to niche down to a specific uh, sport or a uh, specific level, whether it's college or professional, but we don't talk about that they need to go through and learn all these different situations and scenarios with you know, older clientele, younger clientele, and then you really learn and understand the body from all perspectives. So you need a lot of perspective to kind of accumulate, to accumulate together and form what you've learned to this point and be able to then say, okay, here's what I've learned about all these different age groups, male, female. Now I need to start to focus on what I'm really good at, what I'm truly passionate about and kind of pour all of your effort into, into one specific group of guys. So um, one thing I did want to mention before we wrap up here, uh, quarterback University of California, Davis Webb. Shout Davis, out to, yes. <laughs> shout out to Davis Webb. Uh, I think he actually just retired from the NFL um, Good for him. not too long ago. But yeah, he was a New York Giant, formerly yeah. played at University of California. He was the successor to Jared Goff. Uh, so just wanted to point that out for our viewers before we hop off. Appreciate that. Uh, but once again, uh, it was my pleasure to have you on the podcast, uh, Strength Coach Josh Cuthbert. It's great having you on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.